And here's the membrane spanning. Here we go here. Um, here are transmembrane domains. So these are alpha helices, talked about in biochemistry and the protein stuff, that alpha helices usually span membranes because they are amphipathic. Embedded in the centers, our reaction center, you can see all our chlorophyll, different pigment molecules that are hanging around here. We have some um, proteins that are in the, in the um, water environment too. So now how do they work? So here is one of the photosystems and here's another. Unfortunately, this photosystem was discovered first, so it's called photosystem one. It's activated by P700, but we know now after all the biochemistry that it actually comes in second in line in the thing. So photosystem two starts it off, PS2 you'll see it referred to, and it's also called P680 because the magic um, wavelength of energy that activates these chlorophyll A molecules, the special ones in the center, are of the 680 nanometer energy level. So light hits them, electrons bounce around, electrons get ejected. So these chlorophyll molecules are missing electrons because this primary electron acceptor has grabbed them literally. And we need to replace them. So what happens is that this grabs electrons. It's a very strong oxidizing agent. It oxidizes these guys so that it can get reduced. And it steals electrons from water molecules. So water comes in drops off electrons and rips this apart to be leaving two hydrogen ions, that's where the electrons came from, and then they say one half of two because oxygen doxygen is a diatomic, you need two of them. You could also put a two in front of this H2O and then you'd get four hydrogen ions and one O2. But basically this is where we make our oxygen gas that we breathe. This will diffuse out into the atmosphere. Um, that happened over many millions of years and created the oxygen-rich atmosphere that we now take advantage of to fuel our mitochondria. So again, going back, light hits these uh, photosystems, ejects the electrons, and now those electrons are going to go flow down an electron transport chain. Not unlike the electron transport chain we talked about in the mitochondria. It's embedded in the thylakoid membrane. It pumps hydrogens. The end result is that you make ATP, and I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. So we've made some ATP. Those electrons need to get um, recycled, basically. And they go and they fill the void in the P700 complex. So simultaneously, this complex is being hit by light. Electrons are going to be excited to a higher energy level and ejected. And then the 700 electrons get replaced by the electrons that started over here. Boom. There you go. Everybody's happy now. So those ejected electrons now can go through another complex of proteins or enzymes to finally activate NADP reductase, which then um, reduces NADP to NADPH. I mentioned before, as an electron carrier, very similar in structure to NAD that we know from the mitochondria and electron transport ch chain there, carries energy over, in this case, to the Calvin cycle. So the Calvin cycle requires energy to fix the CO2 into sugar, so it uses the ATP and the NADPH. This, um, your book may not discuss it, but I feel like I have to. This is called the Z scheme of making energy, because it kind of looks like a Z. It turns out the Calvin cycle needs more ATP than it needs NADPH. So sometimes when um, the enzymes in the, in the chloroplast detect an imbalance, the primary electron acceptor actually goes and delivers its electrons this way and makes the circular arrangement to make a little bit more ATP. That's like level two information. So let's compare mitochondria and chloroplasts, how we're making this ATP. Turns out you make the ATP through ATP synthase, very similar to what we, we learned about in the mitochondria. Again, electron transport chains pump hydrogens. We get a gradient of hydrogens, they flow down through ATP synthase, make ATP. Biology loves to reuse things that work efficiently. This is an example of it. We have the inner membranes of the mitochondria where all of those are embedded. Very similarly, we have the inner membranes of the chloroplast where the electron transport chain is embedded. This light gray icky color is showing you where the hydrogens build up. In the mitochondria, remember, it's in the inner membrane space. In the chloroplast, it's the interior of the thylakoids. So if you had a chemical that punctured those membranes and leak, let the hydrogen ions leak out and you didn't have a barrier, you wouldn't be able to make your ATP. Again, 
better picture of it. So um, this is a thylakoid membrane. Remember, they exist in stacks. So every thylakoid membrane looks so green because it's filled up with these reaction centers, uh, heart light harvesting complexes that are filled with the pigment molecules. Again, you hit the right wavelength of light. It ejects its electrons. Electrons flow down the electron transport chain. When it's doing that, each of these gets reduced and pumps hydrogen ions into this inner membrane space. Finally, those electrons go to something of a uh, lower energy level and replace the electrons that get ejected from photosystem 1. The electrons from photosystem 1 like to flow down the series of enzymes to make NADPH. And now both the ATP that's made by these hydrogen ions that have built up in here flowed down the ATP synthase, made some ATP just like we learned in the mitochondria. ATP and NADPH go fuel the Calvin cycle. It's probably going to be a good place to stop. Again, go through that in the book, be able to draw it out. The Calvin cycle. So we'll do an activity in class to help think about these carbons moving around. But basically, we need carbons to build all the molecules in our body. And plants are autotrophs. They're able to make all the sugars to get rearranged into the molecules they need to make in their body. So plants are our primary producers. We eat plants or we eat things that eat plants. But ultimately it's the it's the Calvin cycle that is taking the CO2 from the air, fixing it or adding it to an, or an organic molecule called RUBP and making um, first to six carbon gets rearranged blah blah blah, outputting a a sugar. So the most abundant and one of the most important enzymes in the world is called Rubisco. Kind of reminds me of Nabisco. Rubisco is R-U-B-P carboxylase because it adds carbons to this molecule. This is one of the cycles um, discovered by Calvin and worked out all the biochemistry that we don't have to know all the details of but it's so important it's worth a couple of minutes to think about. So you need to do this cycle three times to get a single output. And in fact, you actually need to bring in three CO2s to get enough of these guys, times three, to regenerate that starting material. We'll do a little activity with chocolate bars, hopefully in class, um, to, to push around these little pieces of carbon or pieces of chocolate to see how that rearrangement takes place. But I'll blow through it really fast here. So three CO2s come in, Rubisco, the enzyme that fixes carbon, hooks those three carbons up to three molecules that have five carbons on them. Okay, so three times five is 15, plus three is 16. So we make three molecules of six carbon things. This is very unstable and it quickly splits into six molecules of a three carbon thing. So we're still at 18. Uh, rearrangements take place, ATP comes in, gives its energy off, and now we have a biphosphate, bisphosphate item. Again, NADPH, an energy carrier, comes in, helps rearrange bonds. We now have the molecule G3P, or glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, which is the stuff that we saw halfway through the glycolysis. I reminded you then to pay attention to that molecule. So imagine if this is halfway through glycolysis, basically if you paste two of these together, you get a glucose. And that's essentially what continues to happen in the chloroplast. So to get one G3P out, we'd be left with five G3Ps. So we are back to 15 carbons. Five times one, two, three is 15. Our starting material was three times one, two, three, four, five, three times five, 15. So basically there are seven steps here that our book graciously doesn't have make us go through. In fact, um, some of the steps are still being studied. They're so difficult to tease apart. Um, seven steps up here, again, using some more ATP that rearranges these bonds, these five, three carbon things and makes three, five carbon things. And now we're ready to go through the cycle again. Important things to remember from this picture, Calvin cycle, it's where we take CO2, fix it into the system with the enzyme called Rubisco, use ATP and NADPH energy to make G3P or glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, which is um, a precursor to glucose. That's how we get our food. Oops, gonna go through that again. Don't want to. So, last thing. 
What happens if a plant is in an extraordinarily hot environment? It's being cooked by the sun, like maybe some sugar cane or pineapples on Maui. Um, plants have evolved ways of dealing with this. So one way of dealing with it, I'm just going to go backwards here, is to close your stomata. Don't let any water evaporate because that's bad. You wilt, right? And deal with it. The problem is, is if you close your stomata on your leaf and you don't allow gas exchange to take place, you don't let the water evaporate, but you also don't let the oxygen escape or the CO2 come in. So what's going to happen? You don't have CO2 to fuel this reaction. And one awful thing, Rubisco is an ancient enzyme. It actually can take O2 because it's not too different in shape than this. It is different, but it's not too different. And fix O2 to this RUBP, and then it exits the cycle. This is called photorespiration, and now basically those carbons are trashed. We can't use them. So photorespiration, where you take oxygen and fix it to your um, RUBP, is really bad. So plants needed to evolve a different way of dealing with the heat and closing up their stomata during the heat of the day. And there are two systems that evolved. One's called the C4 system, and the other one is called the CAM plants. So let's go through the C4 system first. The C4 system did it by making um, a new a new cell. So they did a mesophyll cell, and then they have a bundle sheath cell that's closer to the veins. So basically, they spatially separated the enzyme that fixes the CO2. So our Rubisco guy gets moved away from where the oxygen builds up when they close the stomata. Essentially, CO2 comes in, it gets fixed into this organic acid that they are not going to tell us the name of, don't worry about it, and then drops off that organic acid, it's a four carbon organic acid, drops off one of its CO2s to the Calvin cycle in the bundle sheath cell in another place so that they can basically cram CO2 in away from the oxygen. And now Rubisco takes that CO2 and fixes it. Um, the CO2 is not being fixed by Rubisco up here, it's by another enzyme. So similarly, CAM plants will fix CO2 into that same organic acid using that enzyme. But what the CAM plants do is they do it at night. So they open their stomata at night and they run this organic acid system. And then during the day when there's enough ATP around in NAD8, NADPH, they drop off their CO2 from that organic acid. It gets fixed by Rubisco and you make your sugars. So the C4 plants do it spatially. The CAM plants do it temporally by different times. Why is this important? Do you have to know all the details? Not so much. You need to know that it's a method that evolved that separates the CO2 fixation from where the oxygen builds up to allow these plants to deal with a problem. That's evolution. Plants evolved to deal with a problem. It was a pretty complicated change that they did. And again, similar to the way we've talked about the ATP synthase, evolved once and kind of got perfected. These guys use the same process, so they kind of evolved one idea once and then just kind of tweaked it a little bit by the day-night system versus the location system. So this is just a good summary slide. Um, photosynthesis is light hitting the membranes inside the chloroplast. These membranes are called thylakoid membranes. When they're stacked, they are grana. Um, this is where our chlorophyll molecules are located that harvest the energy. They go through a system that makes ATP and NADPH, which fuels is the energy to fuel the Calvin cycle, where we take CO2 in, siphon off three carbon sugars, and um, ex store it as starch or export it as sucrose in the plant. Another byproduct that's handy for us that we've evolved to use is O2. It gets evolved very early on. Remember, water gets ripped apart so that we can satisfy the electrons needed to basically resatisfy photosystem 2. And lastly, you can go do this on your own. You can watch um, Paul Anderson's video on photosynthesis, screencast on photosynthesis. I tell you many times I love this guy. He does a good job. You'll get to hear him um, speak about the same process in um, slightly different words, but same idea.